uh, I am not Lynn Hunt. <laughs> but I agree with everything she said. She gave a very uh, insightful account of the sort of theoretical aspect of Roger's work. And uh, I, my approach is going to be more terre a terre, down to earth uh, exposition of actually his biography. Uh, my assignment is to trace uh, Roger Chartier's development as a, an historian of the book. Now, aside from the, the fact that I have to do it within 15 minutes, uh, that presents a problem because I am a great friend and admirer of Roger. In fact, our friendship goes back to 1971, and I want to seize this occasion to pay tribute to Roger both as a dear friend and a superb historian. One of the rare top tier academics without an ounce of self-importance or pomposity and with a great sense of humor. So I should admit from the outset that there will be some bias in this presentation. <laughs> now, as a way of minimizing my bias, I can draw on Roger's own view of his development as an historian, which appeared in his Titre et Travaux, the pamphlet that he composed for the professors at the Collège de France, where he assumed his chair in 2007. In it, he defined the trajectory of his work from the very beginning. He had three concerns, he wrote the interpretation of texts, the materiality of books, and the appropriation of the printed word, especially in the process of reading. Now, those concerns, as he saw them, in retrospect, made his path deviate from that of others, read the Anal School, who remained committed to, and I'm quoting him now, a social and statistical variety of cultural history inscribed within the then dominant paradigm of the history of mentalities, end quote. Now, I'm sure that's true, but if you reread Roger's first publications, and I've had a wonderful time rereading my whole collection, the trajectory isn't so clear. In his first work actually conformed closely to the anal paradigm, and far from following a logical line of development, his deviation from the dominant model involved a great deal of improvisation and uh, responses to unforeseeable uh, contingencies. I don't know if we are allowed to use the word contingency, but I find it occurring to myself more and more. So let me begin with a tribute to the French army. We, we book historians owe a great debt of gratitude to the French army, specifically its deuxième division blindé. Imagine the consternation of the commanding officer when he learned that he had been assigned an unusual 24-year-old conscript in 1970, a graduate of the École Normale Supérieure de Saint-Cloud, who had come in first, first, in the Agrégation d'Histoire. What do you do with such a prodigy? The officer wisely set him to work in the military library of Versailles, and the rest literally is history. <laughs> in 1971, Roger sent me an off-print of the first article that he had published in an academic journal, Livre et Espace, Circuits Commerciaux et Géographie Culturelle de la Librairie Lyonnaise au XVIIIe siècle, uh, along with a letter written, quote, from my military library, end quote. The army isn't boring, he wrote, and I can work for myself, end quote. Now, the resulting article is one of the best contributions to the history of books that I have ever read. 
but it is full of statistical tables and maps in the Annal style. And it takes its cue from two works that epitomize that standard. The dominant paradigm that Roger said he later rejected. Henri Jean Martin's uh, Livre Pouvoir et Société à Paris au XVIIe siècle and the collective work directed by François Furet, Livre et Société dans la France du XVIIIe siècle. The same is true of Roger's other early publications, including his study of the École Royale du Génie de Mézières of 1973. It's replete with bar graphs and maps, along with a footnote thanking General Guérin, the commanding officer of the École. So much for the military industrial complex. <laughs> In the following year, 1974, Roger collaborated on an article with Daniel Roche, his former teacher at Saint-Cloud, who had become a close friend. Le livre, un changement de perspective. This change was actually, was actually a reaffirmation of the methods and concepts employed by Martin and the Livre et Société group. Roger and Roche emphasized the importance of quantification as the key to a what they called cultural sociology that would reveal, quoting again, collective mentality, le mental collectif. In a sequel, L'Histoire Quantitative du Livre, written three years later, Roger and Roche defended quantification against the objections of historians like Franco Venturi, insisting that it provided a path into, I'm quoting again, collective mentalities. They cited favorably Pierre Chonu's formula of serial history at the third level, histoire serielle du troisième niveau, having by then participated in his seminar, uh, Chonu's seminar, at Paris, uh, Paris 4, and the seminar of Martin at the Ecole des Chartes. I mean, two terrific seminars, which were uh, really pépinières of new ideas. Um, still, they noted exceptions to this paradigm, which they were reaffirming in these works I've cited. They included, the exceptions, Carlo Ginsberg's The Cheese and the Worms, Elizabeth Eisenstein's The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, and my own work on the Encyclopédie. They also conceded that quantitative history should be combined with the study of the evolution of discourse, I'm quoting him again, and the deciphering of texts. Uh, just as Roger had done in his research on the popular genre of the art de mourir, the arts of dying, uh, in collaboration with Daniel Roche. The paradigm, in other words, was developing cracks. In a note uh, on the off-print of his study on the art de mourir that he sent to me in 1976, Roger wrote with self-irony, quote, for Bob, as a souvenir of a good discussion, a piece of serial history at the third level, end quote. <laughs> so I've had great fun rereading the dedications and the notes that Roger sent to me since 1971. By 1981, in a review entitled L'Ancien Régime Typographique, Roger asserted that book history had moved away from macroscopic uh, quantification toward microscopic case studies, notably in the, re the practices of reading, which drew inspiration from Michel de Certeau. He would later go on to publish fundamental studies on the history of reading, notably Lecture et Lecteurs dans la France de l'Ancien Régime, 1987, but also Back in uh, 1981, his article on the Cahier de Doléances of 1789 
remain faithful to quantification and the techniques of the Livre et Société group. In my view, the first big change came with the monumental Histoire de l'édition française, edited by Roger with Henri Jean Martin, whose first volume appeared in 1982. Now, Roger did most of the work on this extraordinary four volume encyclopédie, the first of the great national histories of the book, although he suggested that Martin's name appear first on the title page. Chartier comes before Martin in the alphabet, which I think was a modest and generous gesture that is typical of Roger. In coordinating the work of many collaborators, exploring unfamiliar paths, and synthesizing vast amounts of information in his own contributions to the Histoire de l'Édition Française, Roger developed a new sense of unfamiliar possibilities in book history. He doesn't like the comparison, but in my eyes, he became the Diderot of the history of books, and he still is. Now, how to characterize that breakthrough? It's so rich and varied that I don't have time to discuss it all, but I should mention Roger's engagement with theory and methodology, although Lynn has gone over that quite nicely. Theoretical reflections proliferate in all his recent writing, along with references to the writers that inspire him. De Certeau, Foucault, Bourdieu, Elias, Mackenzie, and Ricoeur, along with scholars such as Philippe Ariès and Peter Stalibras, who have influenced Roger's increasing concern with the specifics of cultural practices. Daniel Roche has remained his closest ally, although after attending the defense of Daniel's monumental thèse d'état on provincial academies in the 18th century, Roger shocked his friends by saying, quote, I will never do a thesis, end quote. How could you ascend to the summit of French academic life if you did not produce a gigantic thèse d'état? Yet, Roger reached the Collège de France as Daniel's successor, and he did so by creating a path of his own. Now, I don't have enough time to describe that route, and I assume that you are all familiar with Roger's most recent publications, so I should bring this talk to a close. But I would like to mention the themes that he has pursued since joining the Collège de France in 2007. Authorship, books, writing, printing, and reading. Taken together, they constitute the written culture, la culture écrite, peculiar to what the French call the modern era, the early modern uh, to most of us, between the 14th and the 19th centuries. That's a pretty big time span, and Roger has been exploring it in lots of different languages, taking on the enormous industry of Cervantes in Spain and of Shakespeare in England and a great many other things. Well, he set out to study this culture, la culture écrite, in his capacity, and I'm quoting him again, as a historian of texts, of objects, and of practices. This according to the manif manifesto in Titre et Travaux. Instead of compiling statistics on authors in the manner of the older uh, Annal school, Roger concentrated on the development of what Foucault called the author fiction, the attachment of a name to a work. In the era of Cervantes and Shakespeare, the reading and theater going public assumed that works were written and rewritten by many hands according to an endless process of improvisation and appropriation. When the names of those two great writers appeared on title pages, the printed book began to be associated with 
the creative imagination of an individual. And a process was set in motion that led to the romantic cult of genius and modern notions of intellectual property. But the texts remained fluid and fungible, and they did not correspond to what the authors wrote, because the books perused by readers resulted from the labor of compositors, pressmen, proofreaders, and binders. By leaving their marks on the book, all the intermediaries between the author and the reader inflected the meaning of the book. Roger combined seemingly disparate concepts, Don McKenzie's sociology of texts and Foucault's author fiction in a way that forced book historians to rethink the nature of the object that they had taken to be stable and susceptible to quantification. Given the instability of the object that they study, how should book historians capture it and work it into books of their own? In his most recent publications, Cardenio Between Cervantes and Shakespeare and The Author's Hand and the Printer's Mind, Roger does not provide a map. Instead, he strikes out on his own, following the love of books that animated him long ago in the library of the military officers in Versailles, and I believe far back into his childhood. Freed from the old paradigm, he has explored the great works of the great writers, Cervantes, Shakespeare, and Moliere, as you know from this conference, showing how they have been adapted, revised, rewritten, and recycled within the context of other works and shifting cultural practices. Does that mean that book historians can become literary critics? Why not? Provided that, like Roger, they keep a firm grip on the historicity that makes books endlessly meaningful.